And the title is this one, We Can But Should We? Analytics, AI, Machine Learning. We are now on the third, if not fourth cycle of the hype around the abilities of AI to solve all of the human problems, or if you're on the opposite side, AI is going to lead to catastrophe and we'll end up in a terminated type of environment. Over the, last two, the previous two cycles in the 60s, the 80s, we kind of rushed in, lots of money poured into the field, and eventually nothing much actually happened. The funding dried up and it waited a 10, 15 years. And the current cycle started around about 2000, thereabouts. And has built in a slightly different direction. It's included things like cognitive computing. <coughs> it's included things like uh, clever forms of machine learning, which we see in the self-driving cars, to some extent, as in, to some extent, they're successful. And so there are other things where we can see that the tools are amazingly capable of doing things but they raise a range of questions in terms of ethics and governance and even trust. So we'll look a little bit about the questions of big data, where it's coming from, how it can be analyzed, and then we'll look at some of the interesting issues raised by artificial intelligence uh, and machine learning. You see, as academics, it is generally not our role, I believe, to go push some of these modern technologies. It is our role, as we do with our undergraduate students, or with all of our students, to teach them critical thinking and critical analysis. That is the only thing we teach. We use the subject area, the domain, as a vehicle for teaching them critical thinking and critical analysis. As academics, we should not be trying to tip information into our students' heads. They can go find it. There is so much information about the each domain out there in all the publications that we put out in our academic conferences and everywhere else. If it's written, they can go learn it. They can go research it. They don't need us to spend hours boringly reading off the slides the stuff they can read elsewhere. Our role is critical analysis, critical thinking. And in the modern fields of AI, machine learning, big data analytics, and even the most modern, modern of the hyped, overhyped technology, the blockchain, we need to get people thinking carefully of first and second and third order consequences before we even worry about anything else. And this is what I'm going to be doing today. In the role of big data analytics, machine learning, AI, we have a lot of interesting questions that we need to ask, all around the quest points of governance, trust, ethics, about IT projects, about big data, about advanced algorithms, and security and privacy, and all of these sort of things which are really, really important. The first thing to remember is that IT projects are extraordinarily unsuccessful. So research has been going on for the last 24 years by the Standish Group um, from Boston has shown that projects which they call successful on the grounds of being on time to budget and now delivering benefits, business benefits, is around about 35, 30 odd percent. All projects are successful. All the others are unsuccessful, they fail, or they're challenged and do not deliver business benefits, they're late with over budget and eat money right there tomorrow. Only 30% of IT related projects are successful and have been like that for 25 plus years. So that's the first thing to remember. IT is one of the most unsuccessful technologies in the world in terms of um, development of new projects and getting them practice is a fact. We have to deal with it. We have to 
that, but when I talk to give this sort of talk to businesses, I tell them a whole lot of advice about how they need to start to actually begin to address this problem of get, having unsuccessful projects. They try too many projects and stuff. In terms of big data, most organizations have no clue of so what data they have around them or what to do with it. They don't know how accurate the data is or how biased it is. They know nothing about the data they hold within their own organization. And this is particularly true the higher up an organization that you go. They know, understand less and less about the data. They just know they've got lots of data there and their peers and outside industries, suppliers are telling them, you've got big data, go use it, it's fantastic and valuable. We get data from everywhere. Data from trackers on our cameras that location tag our photos or our phones location tag our photos. They produce videos, they produce lots and lots of data, huge amounts. We have these things here that are around your wrist, the fitness trackers, capturing data at a fantastic rate of knots with staggeringly sensitive but remarkably inaccurate little devices. They tell you how far you've walked, well, plus or minus 25%. They tell you how many calories you're alleged to have burnt during a walk or a run, plus or minus 25%. If you want to use one of these to help get your weight down, you're advised not to use one of these. Just use a proper plan. Because if you use one of those and you're not professional, you see, I've got 3,500 calories a day to burn. Oh, look at that, I've burnt 5,000 calories. Hey. That's 1,500 calories I can award myself with a large Big Mac and a large ice cream. And people are putting on weight as a result of relying on the inaccuracies of those. We get corporate information, big ERP systems, SAP, PeopleSoft, and so on. And all of you who are academics, faculty, you know that your university has some big system there that maintains all the people, people's records. And somebody thinks those are accurate. I can assure you they're not. They become dirty within two or three years. There is data about me on our one at work at the University of Derby, which is completely wrong because it has no consequence to me, and I can't be bothered to find out who to go to to get it changed to the right pointer. It doesn't affect me, it might affect some analysis someday in the future, uh, but who cares? It's too much effort to me, it divert, diverts me from teaching and helping and mentoring my students. So that's enough. So we have, there's a guy called uh, John Easton from IBM who pointed out about six years ago, 80% of all the data we have around us, including our corporate databases, is of uncertain veracity. We don't know which data are right, correct, and which data are wrong, or by how much they're wrong. We just know that there's some problems with the data, and that raises issues to do with that come into analysis later on. This one was one of those, that little tracker I showed you. It was sitting still, just like that, on a table in my conservatory, right up by the front glass, for 24 hours, taking a reading every second. 24 hours, 70,000 plus points. Look how it moved around. Plus or minus 30. Uh, 20, 30 meters, just sitting still, proves the point. Even GPS is not terribly accurate. So if you get location tag photos, you don't really know where they are. I've got photos which are tagged 1,800 kilometers in error. Now that's a special case, and it's caused by startup errors as it switches on, and within half a minute, it was taking photos at somewhere in the right sort of place. But it makes a point that if you just got snaps one up every now and then, you have no clue as to the veracity of that location where the photos take, which has consequences for crime analysis. It has consequences such that the tagging, angle tagging, uh, in the UK ran into brick wall recently because People in bed at night are suddenly four, five, six hundred meters away from where they're in bed. This is not helpful. As 
I say, 30% difference between devices. We get staggering amounts of data from social media in all sorts of forms. But those of you who understand a little bit about statistics and designing statistical sampling know that you have to be careful about N, the number of samples you're taking compared with the total population. And many people have said, who don't really understand statistics and experimental design properly, say, oh well, if we download everything, all the tweets about something of Twitter, n equals all. Sorry, n equals 0.0001% of the, pop the population who are interested. And would any of you who's running a social science experiment have n equals 0.001%? The, the meaningfulness of it is so we have problems very very biased Twitter, Facebook or Expedia if you look, look at Expedia for um, likes about a hotel or a restaurant you probably will find it mostly against dislikes we have problems with analytics, with clustering. Cappuccino and espresso are coffee, but they're a little bit apart. But humans, they're a long way apart. People are getting fat, people are getting medical insurance, which is based on those trackers. We can't even be sure what the machines are learning. This one is spectacular teaching a, a machine to differ, differentiate between the friendly and enemy tanks. Took it through the training program, worked treat perfectly, except it hadn't any clue whatsoever about that or that. It just knew about the background. This could be slightly embarrassing if you fire a tomahawk at some point you thought were some tanks and it blows up the desert instead. This is not helpful. Or we have incredibly racist face recognition systems which cannot see black faces. Both of these cases because of biased data. They didn't put in a broad enough range of data. In face recognition, 75% of all faces in the face recognition system uh, training data are um, white Caucasian males. And 1% dark black females. It's not surprising you can't see them. We have a question about could, can we, but should we? Here, a, a, a Canadian research team found that they could identify with 91% of all gay men in those photos with 91% accuracy. 85% 3% accuracy for women. Or, more worrisomely, differentiate between criminals and non-criminals. Now, both of those capable Particularly about the uh, false positives, uh, which could be worrisome. Particularly if you happen to get caught in one of these, going into one of the countries where they might like to do this. We can, but should we? Should we even be doing such research? You see, the thing is, in these things, things happen in, the, in that black box. The people who designed those little neural network nodes understand what's going on inside each one individually. Put them together into 50 layers, we cannot explain it. If you're in business, trying to make loan decisions, it's cheap and quick to do that, but you cannot explain it. GDPR, the General Data Protection Regulation in Europe, says you've got to be able to explain the decision process, but you can't. It's much easier, but takes longer, so slower, but takes longer, and more expensive to do the proper algorithmic one. I've got till half past. I have till half past, Joe said. He's giving me the full length to half past. Oh, he's... Okay. That's why he did it very quickly. Okay. So, if you're an insurance company or a loan company, it's very quick. It's, can, you can do this by training your neural network or your predictive um, system over, over a weekend or two, but you cannot explain it. Here, if you do the proper algorithm, if-then-else's, 
You can read it, you can verify it, you can prove compliance. You can explain to a human, yeah, well, you failed at this point in the test, and you failed at this point in the test, therefore we can't give you a loan. You can't do that with that one. Or if you use the um, type of predictive analytics um, uh, regression analysis, the data scientists love to tip every possible parameter in there, 100 out parameters like that. And if any of you have ever seen a 100 parameter regression fit, you've got tiny little weighting factors against every single one of those. And you can imagine standing there to an aggrieved customer who wants that $100,000 loan and saying, well, you've got 5% there waiting and 2% and 1% and half percent and 4% and that means you don't get your loan. And the human said, yeah, really? That's not very helpful. And I was told by one of my master's students that if you have a credit card, they, the credit card company will be watching your spend patterns and doing risk assessments every now and then. And one company he knew of gave it to a team of data scientists. And they put in every possible parameter you could have. And it was about 95, 97% accurate. <coughs> they were telling this to a very experienced risk analyst who had been in the game for years. Who said, give me your data and I will tell you who's risky on one parameter. And his uh, analysis was about 95% as accurate as their 100 parameter analysis. So it's pretty much as good as you need. And all he had to do was to look at the number of times a customer had drawn a significant amount of cash on their credit card. Two withdrawals of cash on credit cards, put your risk of, as a risky um, user of cards up there somewhere. But the danger is that you're going to be drawing cash out of your credit card to pay off something else alone. Unfortunately, you know, sometimes we, our debit card goes missing or we can't find it or it gets bounced at the till for some reason and we have to use our credit card to draw 50, 30, 40 dollars or something. Now I hope they don't tr uh, trigger at that level. But the point is, if we want transparency and explainability, we go that way. Trouble is, that's a year and a million dollars. That's a week or two and almost nothing. Which way is business going to go? You see, under GDPR, you're not allowed to have that sort of answer. Whether it's the bank of cat or the bank of system, I don't really care. The point is, we have to be able to explain. And more interestingly, it turns out that humans do not like these black box decision or advice makers. We like to have explanations. And most of the AI, machine learning, predictive analytics thing can't give us explanations. They cannot explain how or why they're doing things. There's a system called uh, Watson Oncology which is a, an IBM product based around their Watson Cognitive System that has been fed all the knowledge about cancer diagnosis and cancer treatment as carried out in a particular hospital. That hospital loves it as an advisor. It turned out after they sold it to a lot of people around the world that the data, it's not the data that's biased, it's a training that's biased. It's tr biased towards the protocols, the drugs, treatment protocols and capabilities at that particular leading oncology cancer hospital in the USA. And they don't work anywhere else because they don't have them. And not only that, the doctors outside of that university, A, disagree with it quite a lot of the time, but also they find that it's an approach to explanation does not allow them to trust its advice. So we have problems with all of these things that humans aren't, don't find themselves able to trust the advice because, often because it cannot explain how it has done it. There's a lot of links here. I'll be publishing the PDF of this with all these live links 
on my uh, own website. So you'll better get at it. I'll try and get Joseph to um, uh, put the links up for you somewhere, um, and then you'll be able to get at it all. But if you go to computing.derby.ac.uk and look for myself, then you'll find a link to conferences and then into the 2018 conferences, and they'll all be there fairly shortly. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Any questions? We have a couple of minutes, I think. mobile phones as an annual cycle basically and we saw yesterday Apple have identified some of the new changes they're putting into their new, new version of iOS, iOS 12 which will come out in October, September, October. Uh, they've put in some interesting new ones which help to block much of the tracking activity of Facebook for example. And I gather that Facebook aren't entirely uh, sympathetic, and they're not entirely enthusiastic about Apple having put these things into the new version of iOS. A different level, I would say that we're seeing that the rate of change is increasing almost all the time. Over the 40 odd years I've been involved in the industry, maybe 45 years, things are getting faster faster and faster. First mover advantage is so crucial. And you saw, in a sense, that that was what happened. Part of the reason for the Uber car killing that poor lady in, um, in Phoenix. The car actually had seen um, the woman, couldn't categorize exactly what it was, what the return was, six seconds before it ran into her. It recognized at one and a half seconds that it was a person and a bicycle. And then for some reason, which we'll have to wait for the computer reports to come out with the full ones, decided not to do anything, decided not to brake, not to swerve, not to do anything. And looking at the videos a few months ago when it first came out, a month and a half ago, I think that a human, an alert human would have had perhaps two and a half seconds warning, enough to actually stop dead. Uh, enough certainly to swerve to the left because if they're awake, they'd have seen the rear view mirror, there's nothing behind them that's dangerous over. Very, very easily. And so, first, first mover advantage is so powerful nowadays with these like, big IT systems, they just go for it. Ignore everything. They're not interested in security first or security by design by default. They just want applicant to get there. And if it's a bit buggy, a bit sort of problematic, oh well, we'll just put some releases out over the next four, five, six weeks, one by one by one, um, and hope we don't introduce too many more. Because we've got to get there first. If we do that, then we're like Uber. If we do that, we're like Airbnb. And no one else can get in. So that's why we're seeing so little quality control in most of these systems now. Do people want to use my clicker? Well, you've all got one. Oh, okay, right. <laughs> Thanks very much. Thank you.